I'm sitting and listening. No, I, I wish I was in a place too. I'm, I'm here because I need help. <laughs> okay, let's look at 19. An elderly client is blind and confined to bed. Assistance with daily living skills by a neighbor has allowed the client to remain at home. However, the social worker is suspicious that the neighbor is taking the client's money and providing less than adequate care. The client wishes to remain at home, continuing the arrangement with the neighbor. The home health staff is concerned that interference in the situation will damage the rapport with the client. Okay, the social worker's first responsibility. The key here is not what do I do first, it's my first responsibility. Miss Pam, um, is your, your, are you sharing your screen? Oh, I bet I'm not. I'm sorry. When somebody bumped me out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I see Jama. Jama. <laughs> there we okay. go. Thank, Thank you. you. There we go. I appreciate that. I hey. still don't see the screen. Is it me again that mess, is messing up? You can just turn your camera off if you don't want to be seen, really. And I, you know what? I, I wonder should I leave the group and come back in? That's what I've been trying to do is turn my camera off, and I can't. Um, so it should be just the camera. Your camera should click it off and on. Can everyone see the question? Yeah. Okay. okay so let's I think I'm going to rejoin the group, guys. Okay. So the elderly client, they're confined to the bed, assisted with daily living by a neighbor. Um, the social worker is suspicious that the neighbor is taking the client's money and providing less than adequate care. The client wishes to remain at home, continuing the arrangement with the neighbor. The home health staff is concerned that the interference of the situation will damage the rapport. What is her first responsibility? Somebody be brave. Is it um, D? Work with the client to accept alternatives. Okay. Um, so what, what alternatives are you seeing? Something up there that says I should, is he offering something? No. Is it B? Yes. Keyword is there. Adrian, I need help, honey. Respect. Yes, all when I report, all I need is some suspicion. Right? Do I have to have proof? Just some suspicion. I was told you always have to have proof to what well, not not really, because if mm -mm. if the child is being abused, but you can't really Okay. The difference between elderly and child abuse. First of all, just for the test, um, elderly try. abuse is a state. Somebody needs to mute themselves. Trying to turn my camera off. How do I even get out now? So, yeah, I back in. Okay. So the the difference between policy wise between elderly abuse and child abuse. Child abuse is a federal mandate. Every, every state should have a, a call center that is a federal mandate by the federal government. Elderly abuse is managed by the state. Every department, every state has their own way they handle it. Um, children have the right to, um, adults have the right to stay in their home. So what most often you'll see is those questions about um, financial exploitation. Little Johnny Bobby is taking grandma's money and little, you know, the, the cousin is concerned. And so they'll call in. Grandma says she's fine and that's nothing awful will happen because grandma won't leave. Children do not have that right. If children are abused, they're, we take them out of their home and an adult makes that decision. Okay. There is a federal mandate that talks about um, the, the family farm. So you might see a question that talks about granny who's in the hospital or in the, in the home um, needs to be in a nursing home, but the family says they'll take care of her or that they will, um, um, she's fine. Um, so the concern with that is there is a federal law that says if grandma goes to a nursing home and grandma owes a nursing home money and there is family property, the government then can come in and take the family property and sell it to get their money back. Now, if grandma's married and papa's still there, they'll wait till papa dies and then they'll still come in and take the money. 
and that it's at least five years back from the time she entered a, a Medicaid or Medicare nursing facility. So that law is looking at making sure that you know what that law says and, and understanding that um, that's why we see many times a rise in elderly abuse because they'll put grandma in the back room and not take care of her um, so they don't lose the family home. Okay. That's just one of those, the laws. I mean, I don't know if that's addressed in APGAR or not, um, but that is, if you don't have the APGAR book, I think it's chapter 10 um, that looks at policies. The, um, the Native American Indian Act is in there. It's not, it's not called that. It's called something about the American Indian Act. Does anybody know what that says? Come on, somebody knows what that says. Okay. Um, and I don't know what it's called verbatim. I'm sorry, I don't have my book in front of me. Um, but what that one says, it talks about making sure that children um, remained with um, Native American families. Um, you know that the uh, tribes, uh, reservations are um, tribal lands. They're, it's a sovereign nation. Um, so we do not have um, much say so what happens on reservations. So if a child that is a Native American comes into um, custody, then we are going to make sure that we work within the tribe. Okay, and we're going to try to make sure they go back and return to the tribe. That is one of those policies that's in that, that APGAR book. And if you don't have it, um, just contact me and I will make sure that I give it to you. Okay. Okay. So then we're going to talk just together. We're going to start off with kind of some administration and supervisory, and then we'll go down to community organization. I'm um, just making sure that you understand these terms. Uh, my concern is, is um, some of the other programs focus a lot on those direct questions, uh, and I'm not, I'm not seeing a lot on those indirect. So a lot of my clients, my students are missing um, some of those th things you need for indirect practice. Okay. So the chat box should be open and you can uh, scream, yell, or chat. Okay. So I'm going to start with number four. The most effective method of ensuring, uh, of ensuring future fund funding for an agency is what? Can you make your screen a little smaller? Because some of the words. Smaller. You can make it smaller. Like it's kind of cut off there. Okay. Did that make well, it maybe, better? Yes, yes. I don't know if it was just me, but. Is that okay for everybody? Okay. So that was uh, four. Everybody see that? Okay, and if your chat box is not open, you can um, do in your chat box, or you can just shout out, be brave. Come on. I'll make a guess. Between, Please do. <laughs> um, I I think it's two, one or two. Okay. So the effective method of ensuring future funding is write proposals to large foundations. Two is make broad-based efforts directed to attract many small contributions. Um, C three um, concentrate on attracting a few large, a few large private contributions or sponsor a concert. Okay, so in general, to funding agencies, so what I want to do is make a broad base directed at attracting many small contributions, okay? What happens if I just have a large foundation that funds me? That person can pull their funding they and... Sure can. They'd be gone tomorrow and we'd be out of luck, okay? 
So it's better to have a lot of small ones, and that way I'm not so worried about if I lose it. Okay. Let's look at number seven. Because of an unexpected upsurge of migrant workers during the summer, the director of a small social um, service, small social agency must cancel August vacations. He expects the decision will be met with resistance and dissent. To engage staff effectively, what should he do? So it's, it's, they're going to be busy, and the staff has been thinking they're going to have some time off, and suddenly they're realizing they're not getting any time off. They're probably not going to be very happy. Three. Discuss the issue with subordinates. Ask for questions, alternative possibilities, and objections. Exactly. I really want to kind of make sure that everybody has some input. This is what's going to happen. So let's make sure we have some input. Um, so when it comes to kind of management styles, is everybody familiar with my X and Y management styles? No, I'm not, no. Okay. So they are most often called, uh, my X is called my scientific, and my Y is called my human relations or human theory, or I mean, sorry, or human relations or humanistic. Okay, so those you'll see those on the test many times. Um, so this is my X assumption. That's a scientific approach that works really well if you're running like a plant. You have Volkswagen here, and Volkswagen, you put your little widgets in the hole. Everybody does their widgets, and we're good. Um, the problem with that is that it uh, doesn't really support the staff. So in running a social service agency, that doesn't provide a lot of support to the people that work there. You see the managers at the top, very authoritarian, you get no say-so, the staff's at the bottom, no, no, no. So that's always the X, the staff does not like that. The other one is the Y. And the why many times is called um, humanistic, the human approach. I mean, you're really kind of looking at making sure your staff is happy. The problem with that is when, especially a group of social workers, trying to get everybody's opinion could take forever. So therefore, that work many times is done much slower. So theory X is the one that is the most productive. Okay. Theory Y is the one that the people are happy. So theory X, um, employees inherently dislike work, and whenever possible, they'll attempt to avoid it. These are the, the, the assumptions behind it. Uh, most people, secure above all other factors, will display little ambition. My why? Again, employees can view it as a, a natural place. They like working there. Um, the average person can learn to accept, even seek responsibility. So theory X, theory Y. X is the one that gets the things uh, the fastest. Y is the one um, the employees like. The third one is the Weber bureaucracy theory. Um, and if any of you work for a major company, you know it's a bureaucracy. It's all the red tape. It's going up and down the chain, um, all the way up and down in my, my agency, like the state and back before you can get anything done. Okay. So those are the three theories when it comes to my um, ma management of agencies, my management of, of um, agency management with employees. I, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, when those are mentioned on the exam, are X and Y and Weber, Weber bureaucracy theory, are those the terms that are used? Because I, um, let me it's okay, let me find your question. Because it'll usually say, because that's this one, um, the major advantage of the bureaucratic organization, the bureaucratic, or, bureaucratic organizational structure. Okay. So it talks about bureaucracy. Uh -huh. And then you'll see the human, let's see here. It's called the scientific method. And that's the X. X and the Y is the human theory or the human approach. Okay. So those are the words you'll look for. Um, but sometimes I've seen X and Y as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It's on that LCSW too. It is. I just never heard these theories before. So. Um, it's a, if, do you have the blue APGAR book? No, ma'am, I don't. I um, if, if have you... SW to SW. Um, 
so I, I, I'm not familiar with their, their um, information, but if you want the APGAR book, I'll gladly send it to you. Um, that's the one I found, and I'll send you a link, just to remind me. That's the one that I found for the best, for, for content at least, not necessarily how to, um, but content, but it is. Yeah, it sure is. So especially when it comes to running an agency, um, that's especially those are heavily, more heavily on my, my LCSW than my other one. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think people have seen this one before about research. Look at number 46. A research proposal should probably not include. Have you seen that question at all? I haven't seen it. No. Um, so sometimes there's one on there that talks about um, as a social worker, you should at least be able to um, understand, you know, what point of research. So you have to have a basic understanding uh, of how research works. Okay, I mean, not that you will be doing any research, but they want to know you have a basic understanding. Um, so the research proposal probably would not include, okay, so what, why the study is necessary, you know that. Why the study will be conducted, yes. Um, the title of articles, okay, that's what not, would not be included if you're doing a proposal for research. Okay, let's look at 47. The agency director is creating a staff committee to plan a response to multicultural issues confronting the agency. In covering in the covering memo to staff outlining the mission, purpose, and the objectives of the committee, he must necessarily include. Okay. That's a lot of verbiage there. Everybody can be brave. Roll out. Roll out to that it can't be. Such a talkative group tonight. My goodness. Okay. So then, um, when it looks to when it looks at um, the agency director is creating a staff committee to plan. A response to multicultural issues affording uh, confronting the agency. So the agency has some things going on. Some of uh, some of the other um, staff of different um, ethnicities or cultures. Um, is, there's some issues going on in covering the staff in covering the memo. The staff outlines the mission, purpose, and objective of committee. He must necessarily include four. Four. The, cons the constituencies agency department representation on the committee. That makes the most sense, doesn't it? I got it right. You did. What's are my constituencies? Who are those people? The Come on. It's a presidential election. Who are the constituents? <laughs> the people. Exactly. The people who have power. People are voting for you. That's why your senators and your V people do what they do because you're their constituents and they want you to vote for, to keep them in office. Okay. Number 52. The task of administrative supervision does not include. Which one of those do you not do? If then the key there is administrative supervision. If you look in that, again, um, the BAPGAR book or you've done some other research, there are several types of supervision. Okay. None of those includes therapeutic. They're supportive, um, there's educational, but you're administrative supervision. Four. Okay. What does that mean, administrative? Higher up. Management. Um, it just means running the, the the program, so that your administrator is the one who makes sure that, that everything is just it works the way it's supposed to work. So the answer is one. That it does not include initiating changes or modifying agency policies. That would be above her pay grade. That's above administrative. What would what would that yes. person be called? That would probably belong to the board of directors. Oh, remember in agencies, we have a hierarchy to follow. Oh, God, it's hard being brave. Okay. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> you're good. Thank you for being brave. Okay. But so in, in general, we, 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 there's a hierarchy of the agency. So we are, you know, I'm the, the class, the person will say, I'm the worker, I'm the intake worker, I'm the supervisor. Then there's maybe a clinical director, sometimes a, a you know, executive director. But so the executive director is kind of the one in, in charge. So when it comes then to making policy changes, most often they may be submitted by the um, executive director of the top, but the board of directors would actually approve those. Um, the board of directors doesn't have any say so in the day to day running of a, an agency. They have more to do with funding and, and making sure that they play a role in the community and not funding out of their pocket, but, but seeking funds. The board of directors is who, who could fire and hire um, the um, the whether she's a CEO or she's the top clinical director or whatever the title is. Okay. Let's look at this one. Compared with individual supervision, group supervision is what? So the answer to that one is one. Compared to individual supervision, um, group supervision is desirable when employed as a planned um, complementary procedure with individual. Okay. Let's look at 12. This is one of those vignettes. So you'll see those vignettes in all areas, and this one's under the area of supervision. A 12-year-old girl with childhood schizophrenia is referred to a therapeutic camp and forms a close relationship with her female counselor. While at camp, the young girl has her first menses. She's not alarmed or fearful, though her parents aren't, have not fully prepared her for this experience. The referring social worker has not anticipated this situation. The camp counselor asks for supervision in helping to work with this girl. The counselor supervisor would what? What would you do? So start with ruling out. Rule out three. Okay. And these were her to go home just because she started her first period. The way we're good with that. Rule out two. Conduct the parents immediately. Discuss plans for taking the child home. Again, it's menses. It's not the mumps or measles. It's not contagious. Okay. Rule out two and three. Now we're down to one or four. So when I'm down to my last two, I go back to my question and, and see if I can come up with something based on that stem that's going to either prove, disprove, or give me more information to help answer that question. Okay, Rob, I think you said one. I think one. The answer is one. Okay. So when it comes to the... Um, Contact the referral social worker, the mother, require that either one or preferably both to the camp to reassure and comfort the girl, okay? Child's got childhood schizophrenia. She charted her period. She's got enough stress. She doesn't need everybody else coming in, okay? That's the normal, normal human behavior, right? She's 12. She's charted her period. That's normal. So we're not going to try to make a huge deal of it. It's just normal. So you said the answer was four? No, the answer was one. It was okay. not four. I apologize. It is one. Let's look at 63. Formal leader of an organization is what? I want to say one. Okay. 
That would be correct. Very good. Very good. Okay. Let's look at. The dog wants a turn. I know. No, it's my, my dog. It's my daughter's dog, and she's not here. Uh, and he need, just needs to go out. And I took him out already. I don't, I'm not a dog person. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at, if you can look at 73 and 74, I'm just going to let the dog out and I'll be right back. I do apologize. So then, uh, 73. Does everybody know what a group think is? No. Group think is when we have all of these people together. So you open up my big box. You sure you um, mute yourself? Okay, you open. Okay, that is group think. Okay, so you're at a board meeting or in a group of people and the boss says, you know what, on Fridays, I think that instead of being casual jeans, we could all just wear pajamas to work. Okay, and everyone's afraid to say something because he's the boss. So we all say, oh, sure, no problem. Great. It's conformity. So we're not going to say anything. Okay, that's the concept of group think. Okay. Um, if you went to school recently, you might know that concept. I mean, it's a pretty new thing that we've actually started teaching. So you might not know it if you um, went to school, you know, more than a half a minute ago. Okay. So then um, looking at then now that you know to avoid groupthink, what's that answer? The answer for that one is two. Okay. So if you, um, the, the, the least effective way, the it's a least, I'm sorry, 70, that was 73. It's one. I apologize. The least effective way to avoid group think is one limit membership to people with no previous professional relationships. That is the least effective way. The others are the more effective way. If I'm the least, if they have no previous professional relationships, okay, then I'm probably going to try to bond with somebody. Um, 78, in, in, in general, what does ad hoc mean? It literally means add on, okay? So an ad hoc committee is to add on. So you need someone for a short period of time. You need enough for a, a meeting. You need enough for a, some research. It really is just kind of an add on. You do, exactly deals with a specific time limited issue or problem. You got it. That's my ad hoc committee. Okay. Let's look at 78. I'm sorry, 79. A supervisor in a large children's agency suspects a social worker is abusing alcohol. One morning, the worker arrives at the office intoxicated. The supervisor should what? Three? It is three. Now, most often, the, the, the first thing you do is go to the client, right? If it's client to client. So most, the, the code of ethics says if I have a concern with my, my, my worker or concern with my colleague, I go to my, my, the worker, 
Okay. So why is this one sending him home? Because you can't, you can't discuss the issue of intoxication while they're intoxicated when he's Perfect. so Perfect. Exactly. Exactly. Good, good, good. Okay. So that, that's exactly right. So you would talk to him because most often it'll say, if you have reason to believe that your client is doing something, you're going to direct when you're, I'm sorry, your coworker is doing something, your peer, you're going to go talk to them. But if they're drunk, and the same with the client too, right? So if we have a client who comes in and we don't have that conversation with them because at that point they're really not capable. Very good. Um, let's look at number um, 81. Talks about budgeting. Some of those terms you need to know. Budgeting that limits the discretion of the executive director and program staff to allocate funds is what? Line item. Okay, it is line item. Okay, so let's just kind of look at all those terms. Um, so zero based, um, that means if you're first starting your program and you are, you know, just opening your doors, you have no funding whatsoever. You are zero based. Line item means I've gotten this money and I can only spend it on whatever that line says. So many of you, I don't know, me, when I'm trying to, you know, budget my bills for the month, there's this much for mortgage, this much for car, this much for this. Um, and they have to stay in that little line because if I don't, if I miss the car payment, then we've got a problem. So that's that line item. Is everyone familiar with the difference between block grants and categorical grants? No. Okay. Are, are block grants? Come on, come on, be brave. Is that, is that is that money that can only be used for a specific thing? Other way, other way. Okay. Okay. So oh, categor okay. categorical grants. Yes, my block grants. Then I always say it's like that big old block of Velveeta. You know, I know that you guys have never used that, but you know, my house <laughs> occasionally. So if the government said, Pam, here's a block of Velveeta, what I need you to do is feed the neighborhood. You can do it however you choose to do it. Just give them all cheese. Okay. I can make grilled cheese, macaroni and cheese, cheese cheese, whatever. Um, I can do it that way. A categorical grant would be, Pam, here's this block of Velveeta. However, what I need you to do is make sure everybody has a grilled cheese. Okay, so the less complications, the more likely people want grant money. Okay. So categorical grants, um, agencies would prefer not to have those, but if it comes down to it, you know, most of us will take whatever kind of money we can get. Okay, look at number 82. Final approval of the voluntary social agency's operating budget is responsibility of who? Final Board of Directors? It is. That's their job. That is their job. So they're not the funding source. They're not giving you money. However, they're managing. Um, the goal is, so there's a check and balance system, mm -hmm. so we don't have an executive director who can do, do whatever they want to do and spend money, um, you know, without being, without having some checks and balances. Okay. Um, your board of director, if you, um, I have a board of directors, and um, I've chosen people who, um, are where I, I teach full time at a college. So my what's important to me is that my students are ready to be in the work field. So my my board of directors consists of people who are in the agent who are in the field, who who know whether or not you know what's out there, what the need is, um, who can say you know your students aren't learning this, they need to do that, um, and certainly then um, if we need some extra money or some extra funding or something, the board of directors is my my go to. Okay. Um, number 84, to evaluate programs effectively, the most important factor is what? To evaluate programs effectively. Two? Two, yeah, I was going to say two as well. You got it, you got it. Um, isn't that how I evaluate anything? So yeah. if I'm measuring it, I want those, I want those goals to be very clear, very measurable. Exactly. Very good. Okay. Let's look at number 88. An agency needs to cut, 
cut its budget and reduce the number of programs it will operate next year. In proposing reduction to the board, the directors must decide which programs will be affected and how the agency will cut its budget. In determining which programs will be reduced or eliminated, the factors that are likely to be the most influ influential in making a rational decision are what? Okay, they got to make some budget cuts here. Two. Okay, very good. That is two. Very good. Yes, yes. Thank you for chiming in. I appreciate that. Ah, number 91. A worker has difficulty sympathizing with a client who depends on public assistance. The worker was dependent on public assistance for 10 years during his adolescence. The supervisor should, what should they do? Four. Got it. You got it. Am I going to transfer the case? No, you never transfer unless. Unless what? Come on. Um, unless it's a counter. Uh, no, no. counter-transference, we keep them. We don't transfer unless the question clearly states it is out of our field of expertise. Okay, that'd be the only time we would transfer. Um, so the assumption is that you are always, always, always the best social worker in the entire world. So that's never the right answer. Again, unless it says, you know, it's something that you totally you have no idea what you're doing. Um, let's look at number 101. Privacy and confidentiality must be maintained by the worker, supervisor, and agency, except. Four. When the worker, when the worker you got it. When I am sued for malpractice, I sure am. I'm telling it all. The Code of Ethics doesn't say that. The Code of Ethics says that I can share um, anything pertinent to that case. Okay. However, that does that exactly. I can share that, um, but only pertinent to their case. We're not going to get mad and be vindictive and share all their stuff. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some social welfare and some community organizations. Um, I'm not going to pick up on research, um, you know, uh, just know there are a few research questions on there. You really should know, like, um, the, um, I'm someone who's taken the test. Share with me. What, what should, what, what should we know? I felt like there was some stuff on, um, internal and external validity mm -hmm. or am I, am I wrong? Nope. That's ringing a bell. Do you know what that is? A little. Okay. So a test has to be valid first before it can be reliable. So I'm always, always looking for validity first. Okay. Um, it doesn't matter. So if there's, you know, you're, you're inviting someone in your life and, you know, you find out they've lied to you, does it matter if they're consistent? No. No. Nope. No, they're not coming back. Okay. So validity has to be established first. Internal validity is the inside of the question, the inside of the test. Does that question um, measure what it's supposed to measure? So on, on the, um, the LMSW, LCSW, and the question will say, and there's a coding. So whoever, you know, when you get that score of what you did in certain areas, what I'm looking for is that, does that question match the, what it's supposed to? That's my internal. My external validity is if someone else takes this test someplace else, they should get the same score. Okay, so that's internal is the inside, external is the outside. We do know that there is not there is not any test that is not culturally biased. We do not have any testing that is bias free. So the question might be um, according to uh, which which of these would just that again. So if you're look, if it talks about bias, internal validity um, is the one that where the most bias would show. 
because of the inside of the question. So if you come from the, the main culture, some of those inside questions you might have difficulty with. So internal validity would affect um, is something that would show the most area of bias. Does that make sense? When you're looking at something like the, the Woodcock Johnson, that's one of those tests of how well children can grow up and take care of themselves. Um, one of the questions you might see is can a can a uh, eight year old girl um, complete to do her own hair? OK, um, so if she were a cute little blonde haired, you know, blue eyed blonde girl, then, yeah, you, you can brush your hair, wash your hair, take care of yourself. If you're an African-American little eight year old girl, mama paid somebody a lot of money or a lot of time and you shouldn't you don't do your own hair. So that's an example of internal. That question would cause some bias. OK. External validity again is making sure that everybody on the outside would get the same score. There are things like face validity. Can I look at the test and tell you what it does, et cetera? Okay. Let's look at questions four and five. Okay. I'm, I've gone to, I'm sorry, I have gone to community practice, community organization. Okay. Are you sharing your screen? You don't see my screen? So we're we're basing this question on the vignette above. I'm sorry. Yes. So you see this one. That's the vignette, and you're asking four and five based on that vignette. Okay. Thank okay. you. Can can you see my screen? Did someone say they couldn't? Okay. I can't. I probably could exit out and join back because I can't see. It's black. Let me. You want to give it a minute because it might sometimes take a minute to. Let me see. Let me switch back and switch back. Let me stop sharing and then go back and share again. All right, that should have gotten it. Okay, I see it. Okay. So, yeah, so in general, when it comes to community organizations and things, just to know you don't live there, you will never live there. Um, and in real life, you might, but for the test, you don't. Okay. So the goal is to come in and help the indigenous people, the people who live there, the people who are part of the community, help them make whatever changes they want to make. The assumption is also is they are marginalized. Um, they don't have the power or the money to make the changes they would like to make because if they did, they wouldn't need you. So you're going to come in, um, support them, help them with set up goals and actions, but the goal is that it will run when you're not there. Okay. Um, there are a couple of things. Social planning is you're just planning. You know, you're you know you're making a plan to do this, do that. But you're you'll see in the question you're not really doing anything. You hear me? You hear me? Okay. okay. Social action is when I'm actually doing something. I'm making an action. And social reform is when I'm actually trying to change the laws. Um, so um, the book, and if you don't remember back then, back then, it talks about Saul, Saul Alinsky. He was one of our really early social work reformers, um, and he, he was not afraid of picketing or, you know, uh, doing whatever it took to fight for people. So when it comes to confrontation, it's really okay. If we have found that in the question that the community people have all the power, the people who have the power and, and the money and the leadership are not budging, then sometimes we really just have to do some social action. Um, and if you think about back in the civil rights days, that might have been the sit-in at the lunch counters. Um, it might have been someone, you know, tithing themselves to a tree. All of those kind of things are social action. Um, and if those are really okay. If we find that people with the power don't want to give it up, those things are okay for the test. Okay. So, a social worker organizes a tenant association in a dilapidated building. It soon becomes clear that the Smith family has had many problems, many of which interfere with their participation in the association. In this particular, in particular, 12-year-old son has been arrested for minor offenses and frequently runs away. Mrs. Smith approaches the social worker and requests helping her son. What does she do first? Oh, I'm sorry, the social worker should. Or. Or. You got it. You got it. How about number five? 
At a meeting of the uh, tenant association, the tenants resolve to request management to evict the Smiths because their son is a troublemaker who's threatened others. The family does not participate in the association. The social worker should what? Between one and four. Um, okay, is four. Suggest okay. that delegation meet with the Smiths to discuss the group's concern and encourage them to seek help. Okay. Um, so the STEM de um, describes a, a problem in the neighborhood. Um, this, the issues with neighborhood relations. So we really want to kind of work out the good relationship between the, the client, that our clients, and their the, where they live, the tenant association. Do some of these. Let's go back from the bottom up. 73. A community worker finds that a community renewal group has developed very ineffective, often hostile patterns for relating to each other at board meetings. The worker would most likely what? Two. Okay. That would be correct. They would too. A community organization group is essential task oriented. Okay. So you're gonna help the board work on significant issues. Very good. Four in, in the issue in the area of community um, organization, an enabler is a good thing. Okay. So it enables our, our agency to help get things done. So many of us are used used to seeing it at um, uh, we're used to seeing it with uh, you know our drug users and things like that. Um, but in this one, it's really okay to be an enabler. Okay. So seventy two, a worker from a family oh. agency. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was I was meant to have it on mute. I'm talking to my son. He keeps coming downstairs. I'm sorry. You're good. <laughs> okay. A worker from a family agency is assigned to meet with a group of mothers from a nearby housing development. Many mothers want and need to work, but they have no means of caring for their children while they work. Several are interested in developing a cooperative child care center. In working with this group, the social worker would most appropriately assume the role of what? She is an enabler. Okay. In this case, the worker is facilitating the group movement toward resolving the problem. Okay, so that really is what she's doing. She's trying to enable and make this happen. It is a good term in, in when it comes to community organization. What's the difference between that and an advocate? So an advocate, she would probably be out fighting for them. Um, she might be working with the daycare, trying to, um, you know, get get longer hours or, or lower the price. So she's, she's more, you know, kind of fighting for them. In this one, she's just kind of creating that bridge for it to happen. What does a neighbor look like in a uh, substance abuse relationship? Providing drugs. Um, mm -hmm. They don't do that. They usually cover for them. But they cover for them. Exactly. That's and they may, they may, but usually that's called your drug dealer, not your enabler. So <laughs> no, your enabler is your, your, is your wife sometimes who calls in and says, you know, he can't come in today because he's sick. Um, or it makes excuses to the kids. So you enable that behavior to continue. Okay. So again, while it's not a good thing in, in that relationship, um, in this one, it's, it's okay. Okay. So look at this one. An example of a social action that uses a confrontational or contest method is what? 
Because remember, it is really okay for us to use a confrontation method if we need to. So what would be a good time to do that? Or what's a good example? Four. Four, exactly. They believe policies are unfair. So we're doing a sit-in, and that's kind of a confrontation thing. You know, it's just not fair, so we're going to go in and, and sit in. There's always a power in numbers, okay? So you'll see some questions that talks about this small community group, a small this. It, it, usually we need numbers to make a difference. If there's one person sitting in or picketing, it won't really matter. But if there's, you know, 35, it matters. In a landlord-tenant disagreement, if, you know, <clears throat> one person withholds their rent and puts it in an escrow account, it doesn't really matter. But if 20 people do it, the landlord's going to see some things differently. Okay? So, just a piece of useless information. Um, before Barack Obama ran for president, he was a community organizer. Um, and he worked in Chicago in the tenements and really helping organize the people um, to, to have... Um, livable situations in the, the projects in Chicago. So, I know you can sleep better now that you know that piece of information. <laughs> Number 70, a social worker in a neighborhood center is helping a group of parents concerned about low educational achievement among their children. The social worker helps the group establish an after-school tutoring and recreation program. The social worker is employing what? What is this called? Is it one social action? Uh, social action is is doing something. Uh, community development. Com why? I would say community development because they're because the social worker is in the community helping the community to to, to meet the needs of their children. Okay, a community center. So that's what we saw. So that's developing the community, a neighborhood center. Okay, so I hear social action, and um, but so when I'm looking at locality development or community development, I'm looking on a smaller basis. Okay, so that that's a neighborhood center. That's what makes it number two. Okay, <sighs> am I boring you? I'm sorry. No, 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 oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm. I'm stuffed You're off up. tomorrow. You know, I'm stuffed up. I'm, I'm congested and stuff, and I'm irritated because of that. <laughs> it's not too uh, 69. A program activity not considered as primary in community development is what is not considered primary in community development. That would be for social protest. Um, because we're trying to develop the community, we're really trying to build that bond, make it nice and neat and close. Okay, so community development, I really don't want to do any social protest. Social action, maybe, but community development, small in my community, I, I, I want to kind of keep everybody on the same page. Number 67. The model most closely associated with the act activities of a tenant's association is our what? The activities of a tenant's association. So if you don't live in, in a, uh, uh, the city, that be? it might be the homeowners association. Number two? It would be one. Okay, so locality development and social action. So the tenants association might have to do some social action. Okay, especially if it's something going on in the building. You think of the tenant association, and I live in a very right now in a very rural area in Chattanooga. Um, but I think of like if you live if you guys live in the big city, and you think of like the the landlord who owns these big high rises. Um, so many times, you know, they, they I, I hear issues about the heat not being warm enough or the water not always working, hot water not working. So that would be locality development, B, 
because it's the tenants, but social action many times because of having to get together to um, come up with issues that maybe just may, may uh, uh, the board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. A few more of these, we'll go back into some social welfare. Just cover some of those. 56. Agencies such as welfare councils and councils on social agencies that frequently used fact gathering by experts to deal with substan substantive social problems reflect what? What process is that? They're not doing anything. They're just getting information, fact gathering. That's my social planning. Fifty-five. The model of community organization that is most likely to use conflict strategies. That's my social action. This is my take a stand. Some social action there. Let's look at number 48. Um, as Haitian immigrants move into a neighborhood, one community group seems to block their entry because they want to maintain a homogeneous, racially separate community. Other community groups are more supportive of diversity and pluralism. There is little contact between the opposing forces. The confrontation is building. The Neighborhood Center Board asked the Executive Director to respond to the problem. The Director believes the agency can play a role in the emerging community debate. The agency approach would most likely be what? Immigration is happening. The community doesn't like it. The neighborhood center board asks the executive director to respond. The director believes the agency can play a role. Okay, so what approach would they take? Would it be two? Attempt to develop consensus by convening the leadership. So consensus means that everyone would agree. Is there anything in that sentence up there that helps you think they might agree? Or four. <laughs> or <anything. laughs> I think it's four. Uh, consider an alternative strategy, um, such as finding non-controversial areas of common interest to bring the groups together. I, you just, you, you think they're going to come together pretty easy? Okay, Haitian well, we immigrants move into their community. <laughs> A neighborhood group blocks to seek their entry because they they want to maintain their homogeneous, racially separate community. Okay, so this right here, and I cannot, I, I, you know, homogeneous, racially separate. And my assumption, and again, we don't assume a lot, um, but so so Haitians are 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 black, right? We talk about the three races. So if they're racially separate, I need to think these people are probably white. Okay. And they're trying to block the Haitians from coming into the community. Other community groups are more supportive, but there's little contact between opposing forces. But confrontation is building. They are not reaching consensus. Okay, we don't want them in our neighborhood. This isn't happening. Blah, blah, blah. The answer is one. Seek to build bridges between opposing groups where feasible but ally the agency with the principles of diversity because it's its core value, okay? So this is one that they aren't coming together. We don't want them in our neighborhood, okay? We've talked about in general to make to make changes, you really have to have a whole lot of people. Um, and I, I don't imagine these, the Haitian immigrant community is very large yet, okay? So uh, attempt to, do, to develop a consensus, nope. They're building a confrontation. You only want those people in the same room. Okay. Keep the edge of debate. We can't do that because we're the neighborhood center. We're going to have everybody in the neighborhood come to our center. 
So we really have to just kind of build the bridges and understand that on our agency, it's diverse. Okay. Questions in general that I can answer about community organization. Let's talk about just a few policy terms, making sure you understand, um, like uh, security and all those good things. Like this question, this is culture, but the positive cultural value that is expressed in the ideal of machismo. What's that answer? We always hear that um, many of our Hispanic families, Latino families, the dad is that is machismo. What does that mean? Family provider and protector. Exactly. Exactly. Um, we sometimes as Americans see that as, you know, we are he's masculine and they're afraid of daddy. But no, his job is to protect the family. Be sure that you read some things on culture and understand. And if you don't have anything, let me know. I'll send you something um, to understand. The, the term collectivist, so most, not most, many um, of our Hispanic or our um, um, Asian families are collectivists. They live in a, a, a community where we work best, what's best for everybody. Um, most Americans are not. We will do what's best for our family. Um, so those two terms you need to know. Um, so um, many, and again, so there's never an all or none, but many Hispanic families um, really do see, G-H, really do see um, children as wealth. Most Americans, we would rather have the big house and two kids and be happy. Many of our Hispanic Latino families would much rather have the smaller house and 12 kids. Okay. And we also know a lot of our families also um, are, are Catholics. Um, and use the rhythm method, um, and also um, just believe that those are God's blessings. So remember when it comes to diversity, we're just going to value diversity. The question, um, the step, would, what you do first is always to look at your own stuff, okay? We all have biases. We all have biases. Um, you know, we can't pretend we don't. Um, so if it talks about a family's coming up and blah, 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 the first thing you do is evaluate your own, where, where you're at. Okay, um, if you hadn't had me before, I always tell you there are only three races, black, white, and Asian. Everyone else falls in there somewhere. If you watch CSI and CIS, they dig up a body and there's nothing but the skeletal remains. And they will say it was a petite Asian female. They know because of the bone structure. So our Hispanics, our, many of our Latinos are either black Hispanic, white Hispanic, maybe Asian. Um, our Central America people, many times our Guatemalans, um, do look they, uh, a little it's like they have an Asian, um, sometimes that, that some features. So be sure that you know when the question is about racism, it really is about the color of the skin or the bone structure. Ethnicity is different than race. What is this that you're taking it from that we're looking at? Social work exam services. Oh, what's that? Uh, it's put out by the people who give the social work test. So before we went to, um, there was a huge merge where everyone took the national test. Mm -hmm. um, social work exam services used to run state area tests. Um, so now this is, they're just old tests. But you can buy these off of their, their site. Um, but I do tell you that most of the tests are, um, um, questions are very often reused. Um, okay, so like this one has like a DSM-4, so I wouldn't ask you any of those questions. Um, but a lot of these questions will be will be recirculated, so you'd see the same questions again. Okay, um, I like this one. In I, first of all, I, I pretty much everything out there I own. So if there's anything you don't have, feel free to ask. Um, what what we're seeing um, is a change in um, those indirect questions. Um, so some of our our um, and I, I would never badmouth the program ever, ever, ever. I think the, the people do do great job, but don't, please don't think that. I just think sometimes um, some of the bigger ones don't always cover um, the indirect practice. I see a lot of the orientations, knowing who Freud is and making sure you understand, you know, how the, um, you know, uh, the um, 
psychosocial stages in Erickson. Those are really, really important. However, what we're seeing is kind of that pendulum swing back in the field of social work. We're literally looking a lot more about community practice. Um, so I'm, uh, most of my students um, come to me and tell me they just don't have enough questions um, with regards to, or enough information with regards to indirect practice. I think that was my issue because I studied Mahler, Kohlberg, Erickson, and Peter. You need those. Yeah. Need those. And there was like one question about Piaget's stages on there but for the most part I was like oh my god I spent all this time on this and there was nothing um, it's been just a test I got I mean I don't know it is it is so, I mean, sorry. I <laughs> and I don't know why in Virginia you have to get 103 but then these other states you have to get 98 um, because every state um, has their has their the right to set it. Um, so I am from South Florida. I went to school in South Florida, and it's still the rule. Um, I've never had an LMSW because you don't have to. I graduated from school. I went to a school that totally prepared me. I didn't realize that people struggled with the test because part of my education was making sure I knew how to pass that test. Um, and yes, it was a long time ago, but they still teach the same way. And in South and in Florida, an LMSW is not required. Um, so I've never had one. I went straight for my LCSW. Um, so every state is different. I wish there was a, a, a rationale. And that was the reason, more of the reason of kind of, you know, having this more national exam. Um, however, every state hasn't agreed how you get there. Um, some states have an LCSW or LICW. Uh, yeah, LCW? Yeah, so we, don't, we don't, they don't recognize LSW here. Um, yeah, it just depends on where you live. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, I, again, I got my degree, I got my degree and my license in South Florida. Um, it is considered one of the tougher states, so I've not had any issue with reciprocity. Um, so I've not had issues getting license in other states. They've just kind of, you know, taken in my license. But I've heard horror stories of people who've gotten them in other states who had to score lower and then moving to a state that didn't, that didn't accept it. Yeah, Virginia doesn't have reciprocity either way. So, so that's, um, yeah, and, you know, that'd be a big old community source work. Somebody should take up one day and, and fight that. Just saying. It's a, this is a hard state. I don't know. I just keep seeing people pass online. Are they better testers? Is it because they just finished school? So I will tell you um, that the I, I do I, I do this again all day. Every, now, I mean, I teach college, so I do. So, um, you know, some people just retain information better. Some, we're all different learners. Some people went to a school that prepared them for it. Okay, um, so you can take the, the exam um, in, um, if you're an LMSW, you can take the exam like your, your senior year, like where you're still in school. A lot of my students are still in school. So, you know, if you've, if you've been taught this since graduate school, if you knew in your, your uh, intro to social work class this stuff would be on the test, you'd be so much more prepared. Um, so it really depends on the college, it depends on the person. Um, it, it, the test doesn't change. There's no rigging of the test. It very much is kind of uh, very, um, uh, you know, hit or miss or what kind of questions that you get. Um, I can say there's only so many questions, so they're going to be reused at some point. Um, there really is not. I, I, some people tell me, well, I, I, I missed the first one on research and they gave me another one. It, it doesn't work that way. It really doesn't. Um, and you never know what's going to be on there. Okay. Um, in general, it comes to take the test. Some some general facts, uh, some general thing. My thoughts, um, you know, don't get stuck on any question. If you don't know, skip it, flag it, go to the next one. Because if I get a couple of questions that are the first three that I'm stuck on, then I'm doing that that self talk of, oh my gosh, I can't pass this this time, and my anxiety's building. So don't. Most often, you'll get back to the bottom, and you will see something that reminds you of the one that was up there. So go back to it. Okay. Uh, I'm a huge fan of accommodations. Um, not only in, I, I, I tutor to the, the other mental health test as well. Um, but so um, don't be embarrassed if you have anxiety, if you have some ADD, if it's easier for you to read out loud, um, the, the people coming in and out bother you. When, when you call, they will say, we don't do accommodations. That's against the ADA. That's a federal policy. So you need to print the form out. Tell your doctor what you'd like that form to say. 
and therefore then that they will they will make those combinations. They might give you a hard time, but that's really okay. You're social workers, your job is to fight and advocate. Um, I've got students, the most I've seen, I have a student who has two days. Um, they divide the test into two days, so she has four hours one day and four hours the next. My most common is uh, two extra hours an extra uh, two extra hours and a private room, especially if you practice reading out loud, then you need to read out loud. OK, so that's kind of some things again. That's just when it can be signed off by your therapist, your doctor. Um, if you've got any accommodations in college, you can use that accommodation letter. So don't be afraid to ask and they will say no if you call them. Just do the form and keep going. What about um, I mean, I planned my breakfast. I know this is weird, but I planned my breakfast before I took it. Mm -hmm. And I had to take it at eight o'clock in the morning because there was no other time for whatever reason here that they would offer it. And um, I stopped after the 85th question. So it was exactly halfway through so I could get up and go to the bathroom, um, which I think helped me. And then I went back. It took me three hours to get through the test. And then I checked everything for an hour. So I used like just about the four hours. Mm -hmm. I changed a couple answers. And don't. Then, right, exactly. <laughs> don't. Yeah, and I don't know if that's what made the difference because I don't. only missed my three points. Yeah. And you, you're never going to know it, but yes. it said in big letters, you have failed. And I was like, oh my God, cover the screen. And it's, I don't know, oh. it's, tr it's devastating. I did not realize I was going to, be like, I can't pass this test. I feel like John Kennedy Jr. did when he couldn't pass the bar exam. Um, and you would be surprised. Uh, you know, if you Googled your doctors and all those other things, you're, it's very common in, in, in all of the licensure exams. That's what my dad said. He so said, it really oh. is. And, and you feel like a failure, but um, it, it's just, it's a tough. And if, if you have it, if your school hasn't prepared you with it for it, um, you know, most of us at this point are working busy lives. Um, and, you know, you really have to kind of seek out um, the sort of the resources to study. Um, so it, it is a difficult test. What, no matter what profession it is, it's difficult. So don't beat yourself up. Really don't. Um, what I what I do, what I don't understand and I'll, I say to all my clients, if you've taken it two or three times, what are you doing differently? If you go back and study the exact same material, the exact same way, um, that's that's not working for you. Let's figure out what what you need to do differently. Okay. Yeah, that's what I think it was because for me, I just I I I left the exam like I don't feel like anything I studied had anything to do with the test. Okay. Okay. Let's wrap it up and get a few more questions in. Okay. Um, so these are my social policy ones when it comes to like social welfare and things like that and TANF. Um, so in general, know that we have federal programs and we have state programs. Social Security is a federal program. Um, the um, um, TANF, is, the money from TANF is given from our states, uh, from our federal government to our states. Um, because every state has a different poverty level, so they get to set their own restrictions with regards, with regards to like who would qualify for those things. Um, there are a couple of terms called universal um, and residual. Um, universal are, are social policies, monies that we all get. Um, residual are things that many times you have to qualify for. And there will be means attested that's based on your income. Um, with my own kids, I remember that term because I'll say, how did you mean to pay for that? Okay, because that's, that's what that means. Okay, let's look at 81. Welfare reform created a program called TANF, which is administrated by states. Its most significant and controversial feature is what? Is that three? You got it. Happen to know what those time limits might be? Isn't it like three years or something? Two or three years? So the federal government set it out at five years a lifetime, no more than two years at one time. Now the states had the right to kind of, of set, you know, kind of work within their own guidelines, but that's what the federal government said when it gave the states the money. When you said five, five year lifetime? Five years a lifetime, no more than two years in a row. Okay, thank you. And that's no matter how many kids they have? Uh, according to the federal government, no. Now the states again can change it. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. 
um, this, some states will have that. Um, first of all, you know, if you are uh, if you are disabled, if, if there are other reasons that you cannot work, then that that's factored into that as well. So depending on again what state you are, is how hard and fast that rule is. Um, some states have a, a work requirement that you have to work or go to school, um, things like that. Um, so, uh, again, each state has its own, but the federal law said five and two. Okay. Uh, 82, the first tacit assumption of public responsibility for shaping programs and influencing social policy occurred in 1912 in and that makes you like, what who what do i care sometimes you'll see some of those history questions on there i would say criminal justice i would say three anybody else i'm gonna ask you either way tell me why you think that's the answer okay um it is it's child welfare 1912 Hmm. I keep thinking okay. of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Uh, when then, when uh, unemployed children were or underage children, that story, that one. Yeah, that where they burned to death. It's a terrible story, but it, I learned about it somewhere along the line. And they were working in the Lower East Side, and you know, like a like I don't know, maybe like a hundred of them were killed in the fire. And it was from that. That they started making laws of child labor laws yeah stuff like that so when we think of child welfare i think of child labor is that what is meant um that? so in general the welfare of our children okay okay just in general the welfare, the of, welfare our of our children okay that makes sense okay how about 84 most of the elderly in our nation live where Mm. in our nation that's the united states <laughs> that's my nation okay. um. i'd like to travel um mm -hmm. that term so let me just right, go back to you so that the term of, of of most of us think the united states is the best place to live that's called ethnocentrism so most Americans are very ethnocentric. We truly believe that, um, we, you know, America is the best. Um, so it looks at my ethnicity. That term is called ethnocentrism. I just thought I'd share that. So two? Um, but do they live in their own households. They really yeah, That's do. what I would have I said, too, really but it would have been a really yes. Do. Can you... Um, well, the reason, I, the reason I asked our nation, because a lot of other... Um, communities or nationalities they 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 live in a more of a family setting they do um and that might be especially under a cultural question you right. might find that you really might find that so it might say um you know um according to um you know most many of uh, our native americans um mm -hmm. you know what would I, so we would definitely say that um and in general um it'll be, it'll be very clear when it's talking about an ethnicity okay, okay? Um, so the, when we talk about Native Americans, um, so, um, you'll see the question sometimes about, oh, I'm trying to think it's two, two beings, two selves, two sides. I can't think of the term. Native Americans many times consider themselves both male and female. Okay. Okay. So I think it's two, what's that two sided, two, I don't know. I've taught all day and my the brain's not functioning on all, all the cylinders. I understand. But I'm something about, yeah. <laughs> it's something about two sided, two brain, two uh, I can't remember the term. I'll have to look it up. But but so that what that means is what that means is that many of our Native Americans really think that believe that they are um, male and female. They have both male and female qualities. Okay. okay. Um, let's look at this one. 86, um, select the statement that best describes the institutional concept of social welfare, the institutionalized concept. Okay. Here. 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 Here.
Excuse me, sorry. So when we think of like institutional approach, what we think of is is you know in our in our prison systems, in our school systems, in mm-hmm. in in our in our environment. So what is what most? How do we most often think of social well, the concept of social welfare? Is it two? Okay. All individuals who cannot function adequately should be entitled to residential care. No, that's wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to say that that's the Three? Three. Three. Okay, exactly. Three. Okay. So, okay. Um, uh, 89, do you know this term? Minority couples unable to obtain a mortgage from a local bank. They learned the specifics have been, inc- they learned the specific areas have been excluded from their consideration. This practice is called. Red, is that red line? That sure is, that sure is. Okay, so you kind of draw the line of, of who lives where and who lives mm-hmm. where. Um, there's also a term called gerrymandering. Um, everybody remember that one? Mm-hmm. That's political sometimes. That is political, and you might see that. I've seen that on test a couple of times, like, you know, when the, the, the uh, areas are drawn to influence political elections. That is gerrymandering. Or, yeah, yeah that's the same as redistricting, too. The same thing, yeah, yeah. Look at number 70, a major feature of programs that have a selective rather than a universal perception is what? Can you put it down a a little bit? I sure can. Thank you. So a major program of features that have a selective rather than a universal is that they it is two. Okay, selective programs are available to persons uh, with certain well-defined personal characteristics that tend to stigmatize them. While universal programs are broadly defined populations and carry little or no stigma. Okay. Give me an example of a universal um, program provided by our government. Universal program. I'm sure none of y'all got any Pell Grants or Pell Loans. Public schools, you got it. You got it. Okay. So those are those are still funded by, from our government. However, they are um, because they're universal, there there's less stigma attached. Okay. So um, number seventy one. In the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975, the responsibility of providing appropriate education for children with physical challenges and learning disability was primarily given to who? Uh, it is our schools, our local education agency. Um, that is why many times you will see many parents who are upset, and we've seen many times law schools let lawsuits against the, the, the public school system um, because they feel their child's um, needs are not being met, and that's left up to the local school district. Last one, 72, the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. Isn't it two? It is. Yeah. What else did the feds um, take care of? What other monthly check might you get that the feds provide? So, SSI. Social Security. Social Security, SSI. So, Social Security or retirement check. Social Security if you're on disability. Um, so, to, to, rec- to qualify for SS, SS with disability, um, you have to have worked um, so many credits. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's 10. I don't know if credits are like years. or I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's credits. It, it is. It is years. I, years. When I work for the federal government, it's years. And Thank you very much. 
SSI is basically a welfare system for people that do not have enough Social Security work credit. So is it, do I have to have worked for 10 years? Is that what those credits mean? It's not, I don't, I don't, it doesn't have to necessarily be consecutive, but I don't know the number of years. Okay. So I've heard credits. I heard 10 credits. I just didn't know like how you um, earned those 10 credits. So you earn it by, by working, like just, yeah, I know it's, it's yeah, but credits, how long but I don't know I, if, if, yeah. if one credit, I don't think, I think it's more, more than a year though. I don't think yeah. one credit equals one year. I don't remember that formulation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Guys, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, questions, anything you've just been dying to know? I'm going to stop, rec well, stop recording right now. So I'm